because overnight, how many were here at the time, or in London? Or in, mm -hmm. See, I have to tell young people now <laughs> that in order to appreciate how famous the Beatles were, you have to take Justin Bieber and multiply that by about a, a, th a thousand times and then take all the other modern stars and, and add them together and you still wouldn't know how popular the Beatles were because there were young people who would do anything the Beatles did. So the Beatles grew their hair long, you grew your hair long. The Beatles took LSD, you took LSD. The people, the Beatles said, no, LSD's not where it's at, meditation is where it's at. That's what you did. Overnight, the whole world knew what a mantra was for the first time. They knew there was a practice called meditation. They knew there was something called a guru. And then a few months later, they said they're going to India for a while to sit in silent meditation, and people knew there was something called an ashram and a place called Rishikesh. This was mind-boggling. And I went back and looked at all the newspaper and magazine coverage of the time, and it was non-stop. Every day there was something about the Beatles and their guru and the Beatles in meditation for a long time. And the flavor of the uh, reporting was maybe India has something to teach us after all. I mean, A, if the Beatles are interested in it. And then, as young people started flocking to Maharishi's uh, Transcendental Meditation Centers to learn how to meditate, people started to say, what's going on here? And they would quote parents saying things like, I don't know about this guru business, and uh, she wants to meditate every day, but it's better than drugs. <laughs> and my son talks to me again, and he's going back to school, he had been dropping out, and my daughter wants to go to India now, but I guess it's better than bailing her out, or, you know, or jail or something. And that was what, and so everybody said, well, maybe there's something good in these yogic technologies. And that alone was very important. But what then happened was people said, why, what's going on when people do these practices? Why don't we do some studies? And the, the first scientific studies on meditation were done in the late 60s and were published in reputable journals in the early 70s. And that was a watershed moment because that was the legitimization of yogic practices and meditation. And by the, by the mid-70s, it had moved through, this is uh, one of the cover stories of the time in, in National Magazine. And by 1975, Time Magazine did a cover story. And the same guru, same teachings, but now it was aimed at the parents of the hippies. And the story was, it wasn't no longer about hippies getting off of LSD to learn to meditate. It was about their parents getting off of Valium <laughs> and, and relieving their anxiety and their stress. And now the celebrities who were on talk shows uh, talking about meditation weren't uh, rock stars. It was Mary Tyler Moore and Clint Eastwood. Uh, middle mainstream American icons. And that seven year period from counterculture to the mainstream was a big factor in making India and India's spiritual legacy, yoga, meditation, all that became legitimate in, uh, in the eyes of Americans and something doctors and psychologists started recommending. The uh, side effect, one of the side of many side effects of this, were that all the other gurus who had set up shop in America, many of them had been around for a while and no one knew they were who they were, because of this whole Beatles phenomenon and the scientific research, they started to get more and more popular. Even the old ones, like the Vedanta Society and 
uh, Yogananda's lineage, more and more people started coming to them. And so now you have Swami Satchidananda who had been here. He started the Integral Yoga Institute. Now he was speaking at Woodstock to 400,000 people. And his organization was growing. And Swami Muktananda came for the first time in 1970 and then later to more tours and, and he established his lineage and his teachings which were carried on of course by uh, Guru Mahi, who was then his translator. And uh, Rajneesh or Osho who was of the, the most notorious of the bunch just had, had, a, had a big following. Krishnamurti who had been in America since the 1920s suddenly became more famous than ever. He was denouncing the gurus, but because of the gurus, more people went to see him. <laughs> and it was very, this strange little symbiosis. And uh, then in the mid-70s, the, the great innovators of Hatha Yoga, uh, Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, uh, started coming, and, and they all started training teachers. So now you have this new phenomenon of Westerners, Americans and, and Europeans being trained to teach yogic practices and yogic philosophy. And this is a new phenomenon. And the prototype of that was Ramdas. Do you all know who Ramdas is? Yeah. Do you know who Ramdas was before he was Ramdas? How many know the story? All right, you'll have to read my book. <laughs> we don't have time. The short version is Ram Dass uh, had been Richard Alpert, Harvard professor, who was, I call him the Sundance Kid, and Timothy Leary was Butch Cassidy. They were Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid purveying LSD after they had done legitimate scientific research, and then they went a little haywire and wanted everybody to take LSD, and they got fired from Harvard, and it's a big, long story of, of great historical significance, actually because Richard Alpert went to India to find out more about consciousness and uh, the spiritual teachings of, of India, met his guru, Neem Karoli Baba, came back with a new name and became uh, a legitimate um, transmitter of these teachings. And it's important because so many people like him that no one's ever heard of, TM teachers, yoga teachers, scholars, psychotherapists, did the same thing he did, but without the fame, which is he started teaching these extremely valuable teachings in his own way, in his own language, honoring the, their integrity, honoring his guru, but being a, a, an American who did not have to be treated like a guru. And that was a great appeal to an awful lot of people. And his book, Be Here Now, was the second most uh, often mentioned when I did my um, interviews. That's Be Here Now.